All right. So first and foremost, thank you everyone so much for coming today. This is going to be really fun. How's the voice? Everybody sound good? I don't sound too loud. I might get louder, more emphatic as this goes on. So, <laughs> so um, today I'm going to share the journey of the Fannie Mae Open Source Program Office. Um, you know, it's transforming. I like to put this as the fancy part. Everything. It's going to get progressively more silly as we go through. Just want you to know that. So transforming open source culture in highly regulated industries. So about me, hi, I'm Brittany Ice Dennis. I am, you know, I'm a Temple University graduate. I graduated, oh, I don't know, a while ago, but with a degree in education. So I actually started off my career as a teacher, which is pretty interesting. I'm currently the open source program office strategist at Fannie Mae. And so what does that mean? I work with community, open source contributions, inner source, gosh, I don't even know, event planning, compliance, vulnerability remediation, you name it, I have my hands in it, which is pretty cool. It's like, it's a pretty excellent thing to be. So I am also <clears throat> a co-chair for the inner source special interest group underneath the Finos Foundation, and also a co-chair for the inner source special interest group underneath the Finos Foundation. I am the to-do group steering committee, new to-do group steering committee member, which is pretty cool. And officially a member now as an independent contributor at Intersource Commons. So Russ is in the audience, so it's pretty great. Another thing, I hail from Cleveland, Ohio. Not apologetic about it, I love Cleveland. It's great. I am an avid Cleveland Browns fan. I do not like Deshaun Watson. We could talk about that outside of here, but season ticket holder, go Browns all day. And then also, fun fact, I love pinball. It's really cool, and I saw there's a pinball machine on the fifth floor, and I have been having a hard time getting away from it. So, it's pretty cool. So, the goals of this session, I want us to understand the unique challenges within FinTech. You know, I want to share the Fannie Mae OSPO journey, which has been pretty fun. Yeah, I want us to, as we go through this, we're gonna be learning about our initiatives as well as the specific challenges that we've had. We're gonna celebrate open source contributions and the impact of collaboration and community. And we're just gonna talk more about the future. So who is Fannie Mae? <clears throat> if you were at my talk on Monday, I said this joke, but I'm gonna say it again in a little bit. Fannie Mae does not sell student loans. They don't. It, that, that company got sued, went under. Some of you might have a check from it. It is what it is, but we don't sell student loans. We are the mortgage company that backs the banks. You took out a home loan, lender, renter, whatever. You took out a loan, we back the bank. One of the fun reasons that I knew about Fannie Mae was in The Simpsons, season nine, Reality Bites. Marge became a realtor and she did a jingle. And one of the jingles was Fannie Mae backs your bank. That's how I know about it. So it's really like providing liquidity into the mortgage market. So yeah, very exciting. So here we are, regulation versus open source. And what I really wanna talk about is risk and risk aversion. We're dealing with money, right? We're dealing with all of these things and we need to be very risk adverse. But yet, <clears throat> a lot of many companies, tech stack is built on open source. So what do we do here, right? Open source, and we, you know, kind of been talking about this quite a bit at this conference, it's notoriously been known as something to be feared when working in these regulated industries, but that couldn't be farther from the truth. And so that's what I'm gonna share. And so also too, with regulated industries, there is this conception that it's harder to get things done, that you have a lot of oversight, a lot of gatekeeping, a lot of different teams and groups that you have to work through. It's true. But what's interesting about Fannie Mae, that couldn't really be farther from the truth because we have over 3,000 engineers and technologists. And Fannie Mae traditionally, it actually is a tech company. That's what we're providing, liquidity, safety, great customer experience into the mortgage market. You know, you're also that perception of the old guards you know, oh, the banks, you know, you see Mr. Monopoly, top hat, monocle. No, <laughs> that's not how it is. People want to develop and they want to develop in a secure way, but we also want to be good corporate citizens. So what we did, a new hope, the Fannie Mae OSPO was born. It was born back in 2021. 
back, I think it was like April 2021, and then I joined September 2021. I was number, number three, including the boss, so that was cool. And it's founded on pillars, right? I started there because we were gonna be talking about, we wanted to work in inner source. What is inner source? Raise your hand if you know about it. Okay, for some of you that did not raise your hands, inner source takes the same principles of open source, but applies that behind the company's firewall. And I'm gonna get a little bit more into that later. <clears throat> Community and culture, going back to the old guards. People want to work together, but they don't know how and leadership wants folks to gather together. So community and culture shift. Compliance and governance, the very exciting compliance and governance, but we'll be talking about it because if you do compliance well, it can be very interesting. And governance, it can be very interesting. And I'll try to justify that. And then also to inventory and automation, inventory management, what do you have? So, the OSPO was formed in 2021. I think that the term breaking down silos needs to stop. I don't want to hear it anymore. I think that it's just been overused. I want to call it building bridges, building bridges across your verticals, right? So it's just what we wanted to do is we need to stop, in my opinion, identifying all of the negative things that come within software development and complaining about them. We need to start looking for solutions. That's one of the things that I think we need to do. We need to start, and it's hard to do, but we need to kind of spin the narrative and focus on the positive because the more positive you are, people are gonna listen and people are gonna get things done. You're gonna have your Eeyores, there's gotta be somebody that's gonna complain. It's fine, put them over there. Give them to the old guards, we don't need them. And so, you know, we designed our OSPO to bridge these verticals together. It's the most important thing dismantling all of these internal silos, right? We don't, we don't need that. And, you know, we want cross-functional projects. So going into cross-functional collaborative projects, InterSource, right? First thing I wanna talk about, that's why they brought me on to this OSPO, because I, one of the first communities I ever got involved with was InterSource Commons, great community, very welcoming, especially if you're green. And that was huge, and so I'm so grateful for that. So what we did is, the benefits of InterSource are great because InterSource really leverages projects with reusable components. Reusable components is a great way that you're going to get the innovation done quicker. So what were we able to do? We, since 2021, did 74 consultations. Granted, it's me and another team member, but we busted our rumps. Right, we managed to go across those verticals. 10 organizations across our entire CIO are now participating in InterSource, which is very exciting. We were able to get two full-fledged case studies published with use cases, which is very, very cool. I'm trying to get some of them more open to share that, but that's why I'm here today. I can only share so much regulation, right? Um, we actually developed a complete inner source portal. One of the biggest things that you need to have is discoverability. How many people in these giant companies get started and they don't know where to go, right? You need to have something discoverable and clean and easy for people to navigate, you know? And then also 116 pull requests merged. That's huge. Teams weren't talking to each other and now they're working together and they're doing quality work. Right, so this is very, very, very important. Also too, inner source, we know it works. Where does that take us? One of the biggest and not fun challenges is understanding your tech stack. We all know what happened in 2020. We all know what happened a couple weeks ago. We all know what's gonna come, right? It's inevitable, it's going to happen. So inner source, it does, it works great. But we had to determine how it interacts with the app squads and the app development itself. Now you have teams that are collaborating on projects all across the enterprise, which is huge. They need to know what's in them, right? We wanna make things easier for our developers through automation. We're gonna need to take an active, not proactive, I don't think that's a word, an active version management control to really kind of develop where we're at. And then also too, when you have version management in place, do you know the blast radius when the zero day vulnerability comes? That's very important. You need to know where that's coming. And that's what we've been able to establish, which is very exciting. You know, we wanna make it easy, right? Just make it easy. 
Cool. Next, talking about recovery from that blast radius. Compliance and mitigating risk. Ooh, you know, very exciting, very exciting topic, but you know, it is, but it isn't, but we need to talk about it. It needs to be known. If you work in open source, you need to understand this stuff. And so what we were able to do, making compliance and risk concerns and shifting it as far left possible. We want developers to take their, their, their core projects from ideation to development, release, and code promotion. So what do we do? <clears throat> Fortunately, we've been very fortunate at Fannie Mae. Going back to the old guards, they don't really exist. We were able to go straight to our CISO and get leadership buy-in immediately. It's not like that for everybody, but you know it does take some work, but they believe in open source. They believe in inner source. We worked with them on a vulnerability remediation plan. Right? Now, now, going back, we know our tech stack for certain applications, just like I'll get into the SBOM process too, we know our tech stack, but we need to have a vulnerability remediation plan in place. So we worked with the CISO to develop that. You know, we determined how the partnership fit within the open source program office pillars, so that's governance and compliance. You know, now we are being active in what's going on as opposed to being reactive. We know what can happen and what we can solve. And so <clears throat> really, where does this lead us, right? We have the software bills and materials. Thank you, Tidelift. We are doing all of these wonderful things, inventory, tech stack, licensing, governance, wonderful. We can actually start development. So what, what do we do? Regulated industry, we released our first open source project. And for those that are in the industry, we did it in less than two years. We were able to go to legal. We were able to go to risk. We were able to develop through IP. We were able to release this project, going back to vulnerabilities. And what is this called? The Clean Dependency Project. It's the first open source project with a clear vision to provide clean open source libraries for the projects and products that we care about. It's not the most exciting project. It's practical and pragmatic. And sometimes that's what you need. There's an immediate concern <clears throat> with the consumption of open source libraries that we rely on with no clear upgrade path. Many companies, many teams were consuming libraries, open, open, consume, 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 consume. We're not able to give back, right? Or we get something hung up in our scanning process that says, oh, no, you can't release this code. That's a vulnerability. CVE score, XYZ, whatever it is. Well, <clears throat> ask the maintainers, working with the maintainers, is that a vulnerability? And they're like, yeah, I don't know, maybe. It's a perceived vulnerability, but in our systems, it's real. So what do we do? We decided to go in with Blessing, fork the repos, produce patches, right? We were able to produce two patches. We want to make sure that we had the compensating controls for when our technologists need to remediate vulnerabilities. So the first one we did is uh, Pandas, right? We, we, did, we fixed the pickle panda problem. I can't, I, I just, I can't. The pandas pickling problem. I can't, it's too good, right? So what we did is we implemented safe pickling. We were able to push the patch to PyPy and Maven Central. First release, awesome. We had engineers in-house that were cleared to develop out into the open, and it was fantastic. And we wanted to make this patch as normal as possible within a development process. Awesome, what do we do next? It worked in our house, right? I have a call to action for all of you. Snake Yaml. We were able to develop another pragmatic, practical patch that was very, very helpful. You know, this is what we did is we took an unsafe constructor and we disabled it. We wanted to toggle the unsafe features, and that way the developer has more control of what is allowed through. Awesome. We have another patch that's coming out, but I can't really talk about it yet, but it's coming. And also just to, like, they're not necessarily clean per se, but these patches reduce the core runtime susceptibility and reduce the risk of surface area attacks. Practical. And it works. And what we were able to do, we remediated over 500 vulnerabilities in our house alone. So what do we want to do next? We want to ask the community, try them out. See if they work. And if there's something wrong, let us know. And we'll continue to work on it. All right. Practical, all this stuff, but really quickly. More open source is happening. I just like that. All right, so really quick, this slide has zero context for the image. I just think it's fun. All right, so where do we go? More open source. 
two and a half years later, we released another open source project. Unbelievable. This is another practical and pragmatic project called MetroStop. You know, interactive graphing, very simple, can be leveraged from FinTech to education. Creates a very simple visual end-to-end -end view for any life cycle that you want to put in there, from a biology, biology experiment, all the way up into physics, and wherever you're taking everything. Very straightforward. You know, it's got a low barrier for entry, which is what we want. At Fannie Mae, we're not trying to release everything into the open. We're being very careful and tactical about what we're putting out there. We want to put stuff out there that people can use. Right? And so we're looking for contributors to enhance the project. One of the things that we're trying to do right now is enable fuzz testing. As with any open source project, we had three maintainers on this one. It's not their full-time job, but this is where they want to work, but we want some help. And new features are encouraged. Enhancement requests are encouraged. Test it. See how we did. Feedback. We're here for it. And so the future of open source contributions of Fannie Mae. You know, we're working right now to identify new projects. And like I said, we're not taking on just any project. We're bringing in principled engineers, technologists, program managers, product managers. If you have a good idea, please come to us and we're going to evaluate it, right? We were able to establish a um, technical oversight committee. That includes, because that's one of the things, the barriers. Everyone's on board. You just have to get them talking, right? Our CISO knows about this. The, his, his VP knows about it. Then our CTO, she knows about this pro project that's coming out. We get their buy-in first, right? If they're like, okay, this makes sense, then we take it to our legal team. Then we take it to our engineers, our principled engineers to scan all the code to make sure there's no Fannie Mae reference or anything like that. We do all of those steps. So that way it actually, <laughs> this picture of the skateboard there, we bumped our knees, we scraped our knees, we bumped our heads. We figured it out, but it was hard. It was really hard to get all these people in the room talking. We knew that they cared and they're passionate and they're not gonna stop it, but you just have to do things the right way, right? So <clears throat> we have a whole new intake process. So let's say for example, our friend Gary here, he, let's see, works at Fannie Mae hypothetically, wants to give back to the open. There's an intake process for that. I know, it's a ticketing system, but it's a system of record and it tracks everything. And that way, in case anything happens, risk adverse, we need to get audited, boom. We know what Gary did. Gary, don't do that. Just kidding. Can't <laughs> you can't stop him, right? And so what's, what's big is, you know, we're also developing an open source standard. An open source standard you need to have. So that way, for example, Ananya goes and gives back into the open, something breaks. Did you read the standard? No. Well, it's there. So there you go. So that's going to make things easier, going back to that easy button. Our technologists don't need to worry about all of these things because we're handling it for them. And so, yeah, like I said, we scraped our knees, we bumped our heads, we did it though, you know, and it's huge, it's pretty cool. So now, <clears throat> another pillar, community and culture change. Finally, we have people coming together. We have an internal portal. What's really cool is we built this portal, and I can't show you the metrics because regulation, but we've had over two and a half, three years, over like 20,000 independent hits to the portal. People are actually going through, they're actually looking through what we're doing. You know, also too, we have <clears throat> Teams channels. We don't have Slack, I love Slack in the Slack. Everybody here from Slack, all right, it's the best. It's so easy, but we do have Teams. And Teams, we're running it like Slack, right? So that way people are actually going and they're talking to each other in Teams and not setting up meetings. It's huge. They're like, I have this idea, let's share it, Teams channel, amazing. And what were we able to do? Now we have 700 people, organic growth, all organic growth in our Teams channels talking to each other. It's not silent, and that's pretty exciting. You know, we did an internal developer showcase. Our technologists want to share what they're doing. And so twice a month, we are just like, fine, show us what you got. And we produced this like really, really cool internal developer showcase with on average over 500 people show up. Every two weeks they are engaged, they ask questions. It's huge, it's a lot of production, but it, it's pretty neat. We have like fun videos that we put into the front of it and it's pretty cool, you know, I'm pretty stoked on it. Um, conferences and celebrations. I'm hosting an internal open source day conference in a couple weeks with a special keynote speaker that I can't say yet but we were able to get a special keynote speaker from the open source industry in Fannie Mae. 
We're also going to do a fireside chat panel with our leadership. But not only leadership, I want folks to be, uh-oh, there we go, still there. I want folks to be engaged. I, I think when you're constantly hearing from leadership over and over and over and over and over again, that's good, but you're driving that top-down approach. We want to get from the bottom up, too. We want to meet somewhere in the middle. So I want our engineers to be talking to each other. You know, we're actually going to be hosting an something called an install fest. You have a problem with Python? Guess what? Boom, subject matter expert, ready to help you. Right there, help you install that. So that's pretty exciting. And then also partnerships with our ERG, employee resource groups. They know who we are. We want to be involved. We want to help wherever we can. And then also, <clears throat> going back, ERGs, special interest groups. What are they? We want people to work together. We want them to work in packs. Right? Cool, cool little wolf picture. But we want folks to work in packs. We want them to work together. You know, what can we learn from our technical communities just like this one today? We're applying these processes inside of our own internal and external development. Thinking about an open mindset with that transparent key for success, right? So what we do? Spun up an inner source special interest group. Subject matter experts from all across the company get together from a tech trusted oversight committee, just like what we do for Finos, just like what we do at inner source commons, to do group, we're doing it here. And it's pretty awesome because people are talking to each other. So we've got inner source. Now this one's fun, trusted open source. What does that mean? We're getting people together to focus on compliance as opposed to screaming from the mountain. You know, we want people to be engaged in it. They need to know, and education is one of the biggest things. Coming from an education background, folks want to learn because they want to work. Not like, oh, they want to work, but like they want to work on things that are cool. They don't want to just deal with like this day-to-day -day bureaucratic shenanigans, and that's what we're helping them do, right? Python. Python, that's one of our core things that we do. Special interest group Python, let's say, you know, you, you're brand new to the, the company. You cannot get this one particular Python library installed. You don't know what to do. You file a ticket. Pfft. Well, all of a sudden, now we have 400 tickets for a simple inst in installation. Started a team's channel, community of practice. Now, guess what? Those 400 tickets are now down to four. Reduced it by 80, 80%. Just because people are talking to each other. Huge. Gen AI, Ooh, you know? So we're starting this off now, too. That's one of the things, folks are excited about it. We're starting working groups. It's pretty cool. CICD pipelines, right? That, it's not, it's practical, it's pragmatic, but there's questions and people want to enhance it. So those folks are getting together too. And then finally, shared developer tooling and documentation. We all know with terrible documentation, our projects die. You know, you need to have strong documentation and honestly, Folks want to write technical documentation. They do. Maybe, for example, like me, I am not traditionally a engineer. I can do some coding, definitely copied and pasted some of Ananya's code and put it in my stuff, you know? That was good. Thank you, Ananya. Um, but, you know, they want to be able to create strong documentation. So it's pretty cool. And one of the things we also say, too, these special interest groups are not help desks. That's it. I'm not saying like they're not like, if you have questions, that's great, go there, but you expect to actually collaborate too, right? It's not a help desk because otherwise then all of a sudden you're doing this side of desk work that's doing great stuff and then 20% of your capacity is now answering tickets. It's not how we set these up, right? We wanna foster innovation through these special interest groups. And where do these ideas come from? Obviously with our foundational partners, right? To do group, talk openly, develop openly, another one of the strong communities here, founded on developing documentation for good open source, good open source practices. Obviously, Finos, heavily involved in Finos, great community if you're in the financial industry, wonderful. I have a wonderful Finos partner in the room right now, Kara, she gave a keynote today, that was pretty fantastic. Finos partner in crime right there. You know, also Linux Foundation, we're here, we support it, we believe in it. and. Then, Inner Source Commons, great foundation too. Absolutely, you want to get involved. If you're doing inner source or inner source practices and you want to foster innovation and collaboration inside of your company's firewall, go there. That is where you're going to get some great information and it's so easy to get back to. And then of course, Python, right? Python Foundation, we're using it. Let's contribute to it. We want to be good corporate citizens. Foundations are imperative for these open source program office partnerships. You learn 
so much from them, and I think the most important thing that you can do is give back to them. It's, it's, I, I wouldn't be here today without the support of these foundations. That's, that's basically it, right? And so lessons learned. What did we learn? This all beautiful story, right? Beautiful. <sighs> Determine your metrics first. This is something now you have these amazing projects, you have these amazing programs, you have everything spun up, everything's going great. What is the impact? That's my scramble right now. Working with quite a few folks on trying to determine metrics or in this room, what can we deliver? And at the end of the day, it is still a business value. You know, it's not fun, but it's our life. Don't take on too much. OSPOs are notoriously small. Really set down with your business unit, identify your needs. I love all of the work that we're doing. It's all impactful work. I think what we could have did is maybe what I could, should have did. You know, for those that know me, I, I take on a lot. Maybe just kind of get one thing really rounded out and then ship it and then go to the next one. So don't take on too much. Um, be very realistic with timelines. Not saying timelines where you're going to get, I would say like what, in trouble from your business unit. Be realistic with timelines for yourself. You know, we're excited. You know, I'm like an untrained Labrador. I just go, you know? And so then all of a sudden I get hit with a wall and I just, oh man. Be realistic with your own timelines with yourselves as well. Also, don't take on too much. Always continue to be ambitious. I think that's really important. You know, the drive and the passion is what keeps us going, in my opinion. You know, I think just open source is incredible, inner source is incredible. A lot of practical information comes out of it, but it is also very, very deep. You know, lean on your community. Very important. We are all here to help each other. Burnout's very real. Let's try not to get to that point. <laughs> lean into your subject matter experts. Huge. Your subject matter experts, people know more than you. <laughs> if you're the smartest person in the room, what did Kelsey say? People left the room. No, stay in that room. There are other people that are smarter than you. Lean on them. That's how you learn. And then celebrate other people's wins. Just like I called a few folks out here, I can call out a lot of folks in this room. You're all doing amazing work. Just want you to know that. So then, where do we go from here? Right? We want to get incubation into foundations. We want to take the clean dependency project and get that thing incubated in OpenSSF. But I need folks to test my patches. I need some, <laughs> I need some testimonials saying that they actually work. That would be great. You know, we want to get more engagement within our open source projects, like Metro Stop, for example. It's practical. It's cool. Take a look at it. This team never open sourced anything before in their lives. And to have some feedback from the community, I think, would just throw them over the moon. It'd be amazing. Um, you know, we want to get more of our inner source projects done. We want to get more metrics. We want to determine the business value. So next year, really, when I come back, if they'll have me again, I can share some metrics and share what we did, and that would be amazing. And so I just want to say with that, thank you. And then, of course, that was taken in Ohio. Uh, my neighbor took that a couple weeks ago in the Path of Totality. It was pretty cool. See, Cleveland's not that bad. And obligatory pet pictures. There you go. I don't know if there's any questions or if we have time. I kind of, I actually did good on timing. No? Sorry. Oh, you have a question? Oh, yep, yeah, you got two. Hi. Um, as someone who also works in a heavily regulated industry, how would you incorporate intersource to projects that have some or part uh, total government funding? That's a question I would do that have some or part government funding. I would kind of just work with the like with the leadership team, see what the regulations are, see what they are able to share and not share. Kind of start from there. Regardless, let's say for example that project is closed off to a certain group of people, that's okay because you can still apply the principles of inner source to the project. It's just closed source. You can still have clear repo hygiene, clear documentation, solid SLA times. Um, trusted committer, trusted maintainer models. You can do all of those things to a closed source project, leveraging on inner source principles. 
But I would start, I would start, you know, kind of figuring out what you can and can't do with it. Yeah, I was thinking there might be some concerns with, you know, headcounts that have to build to certain, uh, you know, contract numbers. Mm. And having people from outside that group working on projects that's going to the government, are they technically now supposed to be billing under that contract number? Oh, I don't know. But I can tell you this, one of the things that's happening in the Phenos InterSource Special Interest Group is a license generator for your InterSource projects that protect your projects with the intellectual property in case that person goes and said believes and then brings that information to another company and you get wind of it, boom, there you go, you're protected. Thanks. Check out the license generator tool. Cham needs more people to test. <laughs> mm. Oh, you had a question? Yeah. Uh, thank you for the good presentation. Uh, I, I don't know if uh, I can push my two questions. Sure. Uh, yeah. The first is, uh, what's the criteria are you using to uh, select the, um, uh, the initiative? Is it uh, the value of a company or any project you, are, you, you might interest you? That goes back to that slide where don't take on too much. What we've done is we were like, oh, this is a great project, let's take it. This is great, let's do it, let's intersource it. Awesome, okay. You need to have community backed up around that. So we need to be a little bit more pragmatic in what we chose. Right now, we're heavily focused on the concept of reusable components. Reusable components that have reach across multiple different verticals. So that's how we're choosing now. But before, it's like, oh, that's cool, let's do it. Right? So we have to be a little bit more selective. Which is unfortunate, but that, things will change in time. But uh, the second question is, um, how, how many people are you on the OSPO? Is it a <laughs> team, the big team? We're a pretty small team, actually. And then our, our OSPO lead just walked in, right back there. Um, there are six of us, including him. And then, uh, yeah, and then we have a team of some contractors that are doing some good stuff as well. So that's pretty fun. They're, they're the ones that are doing a lot of heavy, uh, the inventory, the inventory management, understanding what we're doing and all of those things, which is pretty cool. Yeah, small. Ospos are small. Thank you. Wild, what we can do. Oh, and then the other. Sorry, I like, I like soda. Refreshing. It's bubbles. Hi, this is Deepak. Um, now, with all the fun stuff that is happening around open source, uh, especially around vulnerabilities and so on, right? As an OSPO, what keeps you up at night lately? Like, you know, as you basically start evangelizing and promoting usage of open source across Fannie Mae. What keeps me up at night? Yeah. Oh God. You know, what keeps me up at night? I don't know. I don't. I I can't really answer that question because I try to I try not to worry about work after like six o'clock. But realistically, but I, it's weird. It's a weird <laughs> mindset that I have. I don't know. I've, I've stressed myself out enough, you know, and I'm just like, nope, not worth it. But um, one of the things that I have been thinking about lately, especially after work, is inner source, right? I really I really want to hit home on these metrics, and I'm really trying to figure out how to do it. There's a great project out there called 8Knot that can serve a lot of different facets of certain things, right? But it's gonna be such a tricky, tricky thing to set up on our side of the house, which is totally fine. Long story, we'll save that for after. Um, but I really wanna get these metrics hammered in. That's my most, that, that's where I'm at. It's not, I guess, the top of the list, but for me, it's driving me nuts. Appreciate that, thank yeah. you. Yeah. That's a real honest answer. <laughs> And that's Bernie, so that's Bernie Kozar Jr., that's the dog. The cat is Captain Meepers, so in case you were wondering who they were. Hi, uh, so. Oh, sorry, yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna guess uh, changing people's minds, uh, at least the first couple of years, was, was, a, was a big challenge for you. Yes. Uh, I, I'm, I'm also, I'm wondering, I'm assuming after a while you find yourself repeating the same phrases or, or words or, or something over and over again, just that pounded into people's head. And I'm kind of curious about what, what magic phrase seemed to work best for you. Yeah, well, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, trying to get the same res or different results, right? You just have to change it. So I don't know. I just, to be realistic with you, from my perspective, and other people can have different ones, I try not to focus too much on 
what we did and how many times I said the same thing, I just try to get that deliverable, right? I definitely was met with some resistance, particularly from some teams where they're like, okay, this is my project. Why am I gonna intersource it? Why am I gonna give it to you? It's like, you're not giving it to me. I don't want it. But we know other people can use it. And that was one of the harder things to do. And so that's why you're trying right now, what I'm trying to really drive home is this concept of, you know, when we're looking linearly, we're only looking what, what's right in front of us. I want people to kind of change their minds and look at the bigger picture. And that's been tricky. Um, and then another thing too is reusable components and quantitative and qualitative growth within your project. And that's, you know, kind of where I'm thinking that. So I'm just kind of just changing what I'm saying based on the person I'm talking to. It's weird. It's like I have a weird tactic. I can't really. I don't know. Whatever works. I know. It's, I, yeah, I don't know if that answers the question, but I'm. Well, let me follow up that. What was harder, dealing with people or the technology? Um, honestly, there's so much that I don't know. So whenever any project that does come in, I don't understand it. I read up on it. Um, dealing with people in the tech, I'd say it's column A, column B, right? Where can it, re can it reach? How can it impact? And then also changing people's minds, right? And also then another thing too, well, I have this amazing project and I'm like, uh, it's not that not that big that I can support it right now because I'm a small team. And I hate letting people down, so. Mm -hmm. I think we're at time. Yeah, I think that's it. Thank you.